Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about type of care and the NSEC data. And type of care, of course, can uh, include so many different dimensions of early care and education. Um, the way the NSEC data are designed, we will really be talking at this point about the most fundamental definitions um, that have the largest sample sizes and that are almost built into the design. Uh, what you'll find later is that there are a variety of elements within each of the questionnaires that allow you to construct additional or alternative definitions of type of care, but in some cases you may find that there aren't um, the great distribution of the sample across those classifications, or in other ways they're not um, as well suited for analyses. So we'll begin with the center-based provider sample and think there about how you can uh, describe type of care in the centers. So first we'll review uh, who was sampled in. Um, so in the case of the center-based provider, we were looking at addresses that were on uh, administrative lists, like licensing lists and lists of Head Start or um, pre-K. Um, or even elementary schools. And so the unit that was sampled was actually an address. We sampled providers that were listed as serving children zero through five. So if they were actually licensed to care for those younger children, if they were a Head Start, which serves younger children, then they uh, would certainly have been um, part of the sample that would be eligible for the main interview. We also sampled addresses that were listed as serving school-age children all the way up to age 13, even if they were not specifically listed as serving young children. And so you might be in a state where licensing goes all the way up to 13 and doesn't differentiate between zero to five and school age. In that case, um, the address might have still been sampled, but we would have screened first to confirm that they were serving children zero through five. Centers that were not serving children zero through five um, were not eligible for the main interview. And the biggest example of uh, the second type of address would be elementary schools, um, which were screened um, for um, providing early care and education to children um, not yet in kindergarten. Um, of course, a lot of them don't serve uh, those younger children, um, but um, many of them do, and we only found that out through screening. Just a few other criteria which were really primarily built into the licensing or the other lists that we use, but are worth calling attention to. Um, these centers had to be providing enrollment-based care, that is not drop-in care. And they had to be providing care at least three days a week and two hours a day, but not 24 hours a day, not residential care. And they had to be providing multiple activities. So um, this is why um, Bobby's ice skating rink down the street that people may be using for after-school care, but really is just ice skating, is not in our center-based provider sample. Okay, so those were the addresses, um, the types of care that would have been eligible for the interview. And then the definition that we actually implement within the interview <clears throat> is that they're serving at least one child, age five or under, not yet in kindergarten. But then the, we sh they should report all of their early care and education services to children under age 13. So if you have a preschool, and you also have a school age program, then you should report your school age after school program while you're talking about your preschool. Um, when, for example, we asked about staffing or enrollment or revenue sources. Um, that um, care has to be provided by a single organization at a single location. So wh what's important about a single organization? If you have an elementary school that's providing public pre-kindergarten, within its offerings and then also rents space in the same building to a private nursery school. Those are two separate organizations. The public school is one organization and the 
private preschool is a second organization, and we would have chosen only one or the other of those organizations to um, be the respondent. Similarly, the single location means that if you operate a preschool that has two locations, only one of them would have been, uh, well, both of them might have been sampled, but any given location has one questionnaire. One questionnaire will never cover more than um, one location. Okay, then we have um, other types of care. Uh, you can imagine um, various other aspects of center-based care that you might be interested in. Those, you would go into the questionnaire data to try to construct a variable. Um, we tried hard to identify how other studies have classified type of care for centers and, um, and then tried to collect the elements of those definitions so that people could flexibly, kind of like a set of Legos, put together variables to reconstruct things like Head Start or public pre-K, infant or toddler care, um, evening care, uh, faith-based care, things like that, and it, you can go into the data um, to construct those variables You'll, yourself. We haven't um, formalized any particular definitions in that case. Home-based type of care, um, really the primary classification comes from the sample design. We had a dual frame sample design which included addresses um, of households whom we screened to determine if there was somebody providing um, home-based care to children under age 13. And that's what we call our unlisted sample because they came from households, they weren't on any list of providers. And then we have listed providers who very much like the center-based providers were on state or national lists of early care and education providers. And so um, because of differential weights and other aspects of the sample design, uh, we recommend always differentiating your home-based type of care between the listed providers and the unlisted providers. This is, of course, not entirely a natural uh, differentiation. The world does not in general talk about listed and unlisted providers, but the distinction is important given um, the fact that they came from two different sample sources. Um, we also, because that unlisted category really includes anyone providing care regularly to children under 13 in a home-based setting who's not on a list, that could, for example, be a grandmother who cares for a grandchild um, with whom she lives in the same household, and she just watches him a couple of hours after school every day. Or it could actually be somebody who um, is kind of running a business and, and serves multiple children from multiple families, is collecting revenues, um, but just happens not to be on a state list, maybe because of the local licensing rules. And so to further differentiate that unlisted category, we have been doing our analyses um, with unlisted paid and unlisted unpaid. So um, in a lot of the NSEC uh, publications so far, you'll find three categories, the listed, the unlisted paid, and the unlisted unpaid. As with the center base, there are additional characteristics that are available, um, and you for example, could look at age of child, where the care is provided, things like that. Um, but because of the already complex nature of the home-based sample, you may find that some of those sample sizes are difficult to make taxonomies out of. Okay, then we have the household type of care. Um, our household type of care was constructed using, we began using data from the child care cal calendar data that we collected in section C of the household questionnaire. Um, throughout, this, um, throughout this section, the, um, the respondent begins by providing a list of the individuals who cared for their child over the course of the prior week. And then we collect um, by, day by day um, when that provider cared for that child. It's a really detailed calendar that collects um, every minute that child was not in parental care. 
that is the starting point for the type of care construction. Um, once the calendar is done, the questionnaire then proceeds through some series of questions to collect more information about each of the providers we heard about in the calendar. Um, the C5 series um, collects um, information about individuals who looked after the child and is mainly interested in determining whether that individual had a prior relationship with the child and whether they care for that child regularly. Um, the C8 question series focuses on um, organizations and individuals with family um, daycare operations and um, asks a couple of follow-up questions that focus on whether it's a drop-in care, single activity, uh, whether they care for the child regularly, um, things of that, whether it's a school, um, to kind of narrow down what kind of provider organization it was. The questionnaire then proceeds to um, what we call the provider lookup. This is really one of our NSCCE innovations. Um, we constructed the provider lookup from um, our provider sampling frame that we used to build the center-based and home-based listed provider sample. We reshaped this frame so that it could work as a database as part of the um, household questionnaire. We took our full provider sample reshaped it so that you could look up by state and city um, what providers were available in that area that we knew of from all of the administrative lists we had collected. When an interviewer was doing the interview, they could um, then look up the provider that was named by the respondent, beginning with city and state, and then looking at a list of providers, and then just select the provider from the list which would shorten the interview time a bit, but would also allow us to connect that provider to all of the administrative data that we had collected. So part of that administrative data was um, what we call provider type, and this tells us whether that provider is primarily a Head Start organization, a pre-K, a preschool of some other kind, uh, a K through six elementary school. So all of that information was saved on the back end and we didn't have to rely on the respondent to tell us that information. Um, this provider lookup worked pretty well throughout data collection, but there were times when a respondent um, couldn't remember a lot of details about the provider or the provider just simply wasn't on our sampling frame. So in that case, the interview would move to a different section and we would collect an address, as much of an address as the respondent could provide. And that was, was part of the C8 series as well. And so when um, data collection was over and we had all of this data from the respondents, we then began to look at it more carefully and code it into a type of care. So all of those cases where we couldn't connect the provider the respondent mentioned to um, a provider in our sampling frame, we then um, looked up and did a coding exercise. So we took the address and the provider name we got in the interview, and we looked online to see what we could learn about that provider. Um, and then we assigned a provider type using the same categories that we had in our sampling frame. And in some cases, we had to expand the sampling frame because we had a lot of providers we weren't necessarily expecting to find um, from our, in, that our respondents were using for regular care. So our expanded code frame um, came about through this coding exercise and included, um, uh, I'm trying to think of some examples, things like um, after school clubs that weren't really part of an after school program. Um, we had um, respondents mention church a lot, but they weren't specifying whether that was a preschool or um, whether it was um, some kind of other care facility just took place at the church but wasn't necessarily related to the church. There was a lot of rich responses that we were sorting through at the end and um, those are just some of the examples. Um, once we coded all this data, we merged it back in and we began looking at the provider types we had by household and um, we worked through each case assigning the best provider type for the responses we got. Um, because, um, 
it, I, I don't quite know how to explain this. Um, because the provider type could change based on um, the various pieces of information we had about the household, um, we assigned quality flags to each provider type we assigned um, just so that um, people using the data would understand whether it had changed multiple times and how confident we felt in the provider type we assigned to um, that provider. So in the household um, data file, you'll find um, five central variables on household type of care. Um, one is the type of care summary for the provider, and it's associated at the um, provider child level. So um, this table in the slides lists out um, each of those variables, provides a brief description, but also allows, uh, gives you the page number in the household user's guide where you can find those variables. So um, as I said, the first variable is the overall type of care variable. This is the final and best type of care we believe for this child provider pair. The second variable is an aggregated type of care variable that um, reduces the number of categories to those that are probably most useful for analysis. Um, then we have the um, provider quality flag, that's household underscore B qual flag. Um, and this allows um, data users to get a sense for how confident we feel in that assignment. Um, the following variable, BP source flag, um, allows data users to know what source that provider type came from. So that could be something like the provider lookup P type, or it could be something else, um, whether that was um, something from um, the questionnaire data or something from the coded data. Um, but users will know whether, where it came from. Um, then finally, we have this edit flag that will also tell users how many times um, that provider type for that child pair, provider pair, had changed. So if we edit it once, you will see that the variable has a value of one, but if it was more than that, the value will be higher. So uh, the detailed summary variable, uh, the summary variable, which is detailed, has probably close to 50 categories in it, uh, which is not particularly useful for analyses. Uh, the aggregate uh, series that Jill mentioned is the uh, one that you'll most likely use. Um, it includes the eight categories shown on this slide. So the first three categories are um, home-based, correspond roughly to home-based care. Um, those would be individuals uh, who had no prior relationship to the child they were caring for. Um, it was a regular care arrangement and it was a paid care arrangement. So one big difference between the household um, types of care and the types of care on the uh, provider side that we collected directly from providers is that there can be irregularly provided care on the household side because we collected all of their providers in the prior week. And so um, we have to differentiate between regular and irregular care. The second category um, is individuals who did have a prior personal relationship to the child, but also provide reg regular care to that child and are paid for it. Um, so this could be uh, a next door babysitter who had a prior personal relationship as a neighbor, but cares for a child every day after school for payment, for example. Unpaid individual care, if it was regular, is always in um, the third category, regardless of prior relationship status. But as you can imagine, if somebody's paying, providing regular unpaid care, there almost always is a prior personal relationship. The fourth category, center-based early care and education, corresponds to the center-based provider questionnaire sample. So this category four exactly mimics the definitions imposed for our center-based provider survey. Uh, the fifth category is any other kind of organizational early care and education other than what was in category four. Primarily that could be after school care, 
Um, but it could be other um, regular activities, meaning at least five hours weekly. Um, it's important to think about the sixth category, um, which is regular elementary school. We don't often think of that as an early care and education setting, and the NSCC does not treat it as such. However, children under 13 often spend a lot of time in elementary school, and so we did enumerate that as one of the types of non-parental care a child might have participated in. And so category six is generally not in our ECE definition, but um, there's a lot of it because children go to elementary school. Category seven is any kind of irregular EC that was reported, whether it was in a home or in an organizational setting. So that's any kind of care that is not provided at least five hours weekly. And then despite all of the processes that um, Jill mentioned, there are some settings that we just were not able to qualify, and those are all in this other setting unknown final category. Um, as we discussed, the summary variable has much more detail, and so for example, in that summary variable, you can distinguish between irregular home-based and irregular center-based care um, and piece things apart in other ways. But this taxonomy of eight categories uh, largely captures um, the most important and um, substantial care reported by children. So that's our introduction to type of care in the NSEC. Thank you.